Welcome everybody, uh, Hans Ulrich. Uh, thank you so much for co-curating and co-moderating this uh, panel. Um, I mean, it's basically now, I think, the 100th panel. This is how I feel uh, that, that we did together. And I think it's like a plant, right? It's growing and growing. And it, uh, you, you, you didn't really know uh, where it will go when it started. And it's actually going to grow considerably this morning. So we might need a few more chairs because I know that uh, more speakers are on their way. It's a bit like, you know, the famous series of M Mario Merz, the Fibonacci series. <laughs> That's what's going to happen with the panel today. So if the organizers could just add two or three more of these chairs, because then there will be chairs once our speakers arrive. It's a very organic process. Yeah, but we, we already see that the tree that is growing out of this thought process is, uh, is actually a tree that can sustain and that can survive. And um, uh, as always in, in these talks that we are organizing, Hans Ulrich, it's basically uh, like a workshop more or like a think tank. So it's not so much about uh, speaking Cora Publico, it's more about speaking with each other. And I'm so happy that, uh, that you invited also speakers that I haven't met before, that I had uh, the honor to meet with in uh, their work, like Marianne, for example, yesterday, that we were really um, uh, still today at the breakfast amazed about. And uh, maybe you can introduce uh, the speakers that you invited today, and then I will follow up. Exactly. I think uh, it's really um, wonderful that we can start this morning with Marianne Krog, who designed, actually uh, curated, uh, curated the, the Danish pavilion. Uh, and of course, being the curator of the pavilion and having the press conference today, Marianne cannot stay for the whole panel, which is why we start with Marianne, uh, who will then uh, have to go to, uh, uh, to her press conference. And I think what is particularly exciting, and so maybe we can do that, that Marianne introduces the pavilion and then we introduce the, the speakers of the conference and, and go through it. So it's, it's almost like a prelude for everything which is happening, but it is also actually the connection to our last panel in, uh, in Berlin, when we uh, did in September, in collaboration with the Serpentine and Terme, as a, as a Terme Serpentine panel, um, a panel on the Anthropocene, and we basically uh, were focusing there um, uh, on very wide ramifications and implications of the Anthropocene, and we are focusing there, of course, and that's going to be, again, very relevant today, on Lovelock, on uh, Limagulis, on uh, many different aspects also of, of, of Gaia. And of course, many of these ideas play a very big role, Marianne, in not only in your pavilion, but also in the extraordinary book, which you all need to get. It's a, a really, I spent time last night with it, incredible publication. It's incredibly complete, but it's called an incomplete encyclopedia. Uh, of the Anthropocene uh, with uh, many, many uh, authors. So, uh, yeah, it would be great, Marianne, to hear a little bit about uh, the vision of that, the content of the period, but also the spatial transformation, because I was always feeling uh, that it was a very small pavilion and it was difficult. It was sort of cut from the outside, particularly towards the, the other pavilions. It, it felt uh, very hermetic. Uh, and you've not only done a great exhibition, but also really changed the way the, the pavilion uh, is experienced. So it would be great to hear about your pavilion. Thank you, Hans Ulrich. Well, I'm very happy to be here today. And uh, I will not explain so much in particular about the exhibition because I would like you to go and see it. It's just around the corner, so to speak. But uh, it's called Connectedness. And this has sort of been the starting point for my work with the architects. And I actually know exactly when it started because I went to um, a protest march in, mass in uh, Copenhagen where I live. And it was a march in uh, relation to uh, saving the last so-called wild area, uninhabited area very close to the capital. And we all met at the town hall square in the city. And uh, there was an author, Josephine Klogart, she's also in the book, and she held a speech saying that we Westerners for centuries have um, distanced ourselves to our surroundings. And uh, it is through enlightenment, education, control, and so on, which are not bad concepts in itself, but we have sort of through our gaze, words, consciousness, history, made this distance, I mean, just using the word nature 
sort of reveals the otherness of uh, the habitats, which we are really deeply embedded in. And she said that if we could feel the connectedness with this surrounding, and this is other people, animals, uh, plants, everything living, the earth, then maybe we wouldn't have to stand that summer day in Copenhagen and fight for the last piece of open land uh, close to the capital. So this inspired me a lot, and I thought, here is something that we can work with, with architecture. And uh, I also want to say there is another concept that has inspired me a lot, and that is the, the, the term, the critical zone. It has been used for some years in the hard science, geology and biology and so, and now a philosopher like Bruno Latour has used it a lot recently. But it's a concept that there is actually only a very thin layer around the Earth where life is. It goes a few hundred meters up into the atmosphere, then we cannot breathe anymore. A few meters down into Earth where everything is growing and the minerals and so on. And that's where all life is. And if you, if you think of that, then you can really imagine how interconnected we are. I mean, we breathe the air and we produce something that the plants and other, other entities need. And we are deeply entangled in each other, for better and for worse. And these are, of course, also the, the ideas behind uh, Magulis and, and, and symbiotic thinking and so on. And uh, in this way, space is not something which is already there and neutral. And this has sort of been the modernistic way of thinking that space is there and we put things in and we take things out again. But it's not. We create the space together all the time. It's, it's, it's a constant transformation. And you can say that that is the thought behind using the Danish pavilion. There is not an object in a neutral space. It's in transformation all the time, and it's processes, it's energy, and it's movement. So there is nothing outside and inside. It, it's all connected. And for this reason, we wanted to change the pavilion and not have this central door where everything is sort of divided into separate pieces, but to be more coherent. We were at your pavilion yesterday. Uh, I can give the spoiler alert, we had a tea. I won't say anything more, but this tea, drinking this tea is already an emotional experience. And I think this is exactly what is missing in so much of architecture, that it starts with the head and it stops with the head, but it's not going into the heart and the soul. I'm happy to hear that, because that was one of the attentions. <laughs> yes. And before we have the, maybe the answer also to what you just said from Superflux uh, via, via Zoom, maybe a, a, a last question about at the pavilion. Can you tell us a little bit about how actually this collaboration then worked? Because you involved many, many authors in the book, uh, but you also completely transformed the, the space. Um, as Nicolai said, there is the dimension of you know, participation, but there are also moments where one can just experience water. Uh, how, how did the collaboration work? Who, who did what? Well, we had a long process where we said, this, this is sort of the, the, the starting point, and it's, of course, very vague in connection to what Forbes should it then take. And then we had a lot of workshops for four or five months, a couple of weeks, where we invited artists and writers and poets and scientists and psychologist, we had a lot to talk about empathy, for example. And uh, after that process, then the architects sort of did, did a lot of work and they came up with the idea of using water as, you could say, a kind of uh, architectural element. It's not an exhibition about water. It's an exhibition about connectedness. But of course, water is a very potent element. It's one of the, the, the basic elements on Earth, something that we have taken for granted for so long. But now it needs to come into the foreground, I mean, together with air and Earth, and which is um, something which we cannot take for granted anymore. And water is, um, I mean, you can work with it in a very atmospheric way. 
it's very sensorious. You could feel it, taste it, touch it, smell it, hear it. All the senses are activated, which is quite important because we are bodies also and situated in the space. But at the same time, it's also extremely political. I mean, not, we don't have clean water everywhere, and it's a question about who owns the water, and so. So there's a very right, by, wide range in, 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 in to work with, you could say. Great, Marianne, thank you so much, and we will all go uh, and visit the pavilion again, and for those who haven't visited, visited, it's a pavilion we can also spend time uh, and return uh, a big round of applause for Marianne. Thank you very much. <laughs> and indeed, the transition could not be better to our second prelude before we then will uh, enter the topic of today's conference, because again, it's a very important connection to the conference we had in, in Berlin with Superflux, with Anna Jain. A very warm welcome, a virtual welcome to Anna. <laughs> How are you? Great to see you. I'm behind you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I realized it. It's great to see you again. <laughs> now, the connection to water has, of course, to do also with uh, what you're doing with the Extraordinary Garden Project. We're actually collaborating on with Back to Earth, with the Serpentine. Um, but you also have a other current project, actually, which uh, addresses the need for mythopoetics uh, as a tool to actually return to a way of thinking about climate change. So it would be great to hear a little bit about these projects from you to begin with. Sure, thank you. Um, I really, really loved what you said, Mariana. It was, it really resonated because our project is in the Arsenale in the Cordieri as emerging communities section. Uh, it's an installation I recommend <laughs> all of you go and see, uh, although I wish I was there. Um, it's called Refuge for Resurgence. And the work is centered around a majestic oak table. And it invites uh, 14 species, including humans, to gather as equals and dine together. So Refuge for Resurgence is a multi-species banquet that uh, has two human adults and a child, but also a wild boar and a pigeon and a rat and a beaver and a snake and a longhorn cow um, and many other species. So I really invite you to go and visit and see if you can dine with them. Um, this project in, in a way res resonates with Mariana because deeply interested in how entangled and interdependent we as humans are with other species and one way to think about changing the perspective is by inviting everyone to be our companions and dine together so if you go and see the space you will see 14 plates that provide an opportunity to explain this world's journey from the makings of an apocalypse to a new world um, and we have looked at many mythopoetic retellings of death and rebirth, destruction and resurrection, from Rama's battle with Ravana to the Stations of the Cross. A mythopoetic approach can give form to aspirations often present in the cultural ether and allow people to experience them. So the plates mirror and speak to each other. The wasp and the beaver talk to each other about beginnings and ends, triumph and fragility. The wasp talks about cognitive dissonance, casual destruction. In turn, the beaver speaks of the boldness of the natural world and the fragility of that opulent artifice. So we wanted to kind of give form and, and provide this kind of conversation between, um, between um, this kind of paralysis of fear that we are currently experiencing and the audacity of hope. And in that space is this chance to really experience um, a multi-species banquet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we discussed, and that really uh, connects, of course, to what Marianne said, and the, the Berlin conference was all about uh, everything connecting to, to everything. And that's also a film you did uh, with that title. So it would be great to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, the, film Everything Connects to Everything was commissioned for the Victoria and Albert Museum and in that we followed the journey of the simple mobile phone we all carry in our pockets and through that journey from our faces to the way 
we could manufacture these phones to the very materials in in Congo and the uh, earth uh, earth minerals that are being mined um, in 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 really deeply uh, destructive ways, both to the planet and the terraforming of it, and to humans who are engaged in this uh, work, is brought to the forefront. So we start to see that a simple object that we carry actually starts to open up the vast technological and ecological infrastructure that we are all collectively terraforming. And in a way, the film ends by perhaps pointing to the fact that the tools we are making to transform us are actually retransforming us. And that therefore we really need to consider our place in the planet and consider uh, a, 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 a more than human approach to 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 kind of how we navigate the predicament of climate change. You also mentioned in the conversation we had with Rebecca Lewin, actually for the Serpentine uh, Conference, also with Mantia Diabara, you mentioned the necessity uh, in order to actually achieve what you just described to create uh, a new vocabulary, a new imagery, a new vocabulary. Um, I thought it would be interesting um, in terms of also what we're going to discuss later today if you could talk a little bit about this new vocabulary and new imagery. And maybe also, because I know that science fiction plays a role for you in that. It could be good to also hear uh, about the importance of science fiction for, for you. Sure, thank you. Yes, um, I, I'm very inspired by a lot of work. The many I think here in Venice are, are presenting, but also so many ecologists and gardeners uh, for decades and centuries who've, who've talked about a more than human approach. And so in a couple of years ago, inspired by Kim Stanley Robinson, Anna Singh, Anna Haraway, uh, Iris Dunn, uh, many others, uh, I, I kind of created what is called a field guide for a more than human politics. And in that field guide, I'm inviting people to consider a different vocabulary. Can we move from talking about innovation to considering the word resurgence? Can we talk about, rather than extinction, precarity? Um, Kim Stanley Robinson is a great word for replacing the Anthropocene with the dithering and the idea of this kind of anxious moment that we are in. So all these kind of new vocabularies can perhaps expand the way in which we consider our place in history today. Um, and science fiction, I think, science fiction, speculative fiction, actually, for me, even more so, um, becomes a space where we can really, space where we can really imagine possibilities. We can really travel to those possible worlds. And I think that nature of storytelling um, uh, is perhaps something that actually connects and bonds us. So um, uh, it's really a very inspiring uh, kind of instrument um, for in our work. Thank you so much, Anap. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you soon in person. Big round of applause for Anap Jain. <laughs> Thank you so much. See you soon in London. And this is actually end of this first part. Uh, of today's, um, and we actually also decided that we need to come up, th you know, thinking about new language, about what this is, because it's not really a conference, it's not really a symposium, so anyway, that will be for later. So today, um, uh, we're going to have many new speakers, we're going to introduce our speakers of today, but so this is the end of the prelude, where thanks to Annabel and Marianne, we could have the connection between the Berlin conference and the Venice conference. I just also wanted to say that Marta and Gina is here, who has organized with Bruno Lato and uh, curated many exhibitions, the Taipei Biennial, but of course also the Critical Zone project. So it's very important, I think, that Marta and Marianne have a summit in the Danish pavilion, maybe <laughs> later today. I just wanted to be sure that you meet each other. I think it's really, really urgent. And um, yeah, so another big round of applause for Marianne and Anna. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Mikola, maybe that's the moment, no? Yes, to introduce uh, the next chapter, which is the Venice chapter.
The Venice chapter, yeah, and we are we are super honored that uh, we have two Biennale participants uh, here um, that gave us the titles of their works as the titles of our talks, yeah, and uh, they only not only gave us the titles of the works, but uh, but they gave us also uh, the thought processes behind it, and what is even more important uh, than the thought processes, the processes of experience. Um, we had already the breakfast meeting today, the summit uh, with uh, Stefano Mancuso, and yesterday at the dinner with uh, Cecil Tolas after experiencing their works. And it's very difficult uh, to describe them. This is exactly why they are necessary to be produced. And we are so, so happy that uh, you have done it. Um, as um, uh, mentioned today during the breakfast, um, it is. Uh, this speaks more than a thousand words, when you can really show how nature is working, when you can really show and smell how nature is working. And actually, both of these works, uh, Mutual Aid, this is the work that uh, Stefano is presenting at uh, the Arsenale, um, and the work uh, Resurrecting the Sublime that uh, Cecil is representing here in our talk today, um, are working with all the senses that we are neglecting uh, sometimes. And I'm so, so happy that you both are here. Um, I, uh, before, before we come to you, I would love to introduce uh, some very, very special guests uh, from a different field, because very often, Hans Ulrich, you know, when we talk in the art and culture field, uh, we are actually uh, talking only with art and culture. I think we were able to break through it. I mean, you were able to do it much earlier, and with your help, uh, we created now this Wellbeing Culture Forum, uh, the next iteration of it, um, where actually it's not only culture talking to culture, but culture talking to science. Uh, Stefano Mancuso is here again uh, on the very, yeah, uh, I don't know which word to use, uh, but uh, he's actually a scientist that is producing uh, culture as a way of expression and understanding of um, of uh, science, um, and Cecil Tollas, from a perspective of culture, is using science to create completely new uh, experiences. But we have also Jeanne de Cron and Nina Gualinga here today uh, that are coming from a slightly different context, but I think that they are both bringing a perspective, um, uh, different, two different perspectives that are uh, so valuable to have that I cannot be thankful enough to uh, have you both here. Um, we know Nina Gualinga because of uh, Jeanne. We just met the very first time. Her story is uh, totally amazing. I don't know if you maybe want to uh, give the insight or maybe you uh, can introduce yourself also in a much better way than I could. And I can't wait also for you to share your stories because it's a story of going from being outside uh, a system that is very hostile and criticizing it and fighting also against it uh, to help us to recreate the system from within. And without this help, I believe that we will not be able to survive as a species. So we need to learn from this perspective uh, that, that you are bringing to our talk. And I can wait also to hear your, your voice. And Jeanne, uh, we know each other already for several um, years now. And uh, she's amazing uh, as a social entrepreneur, creating supply chains, working with different communities worldwide and uh, creating maybe a new form of economy that is an economy of respect. And I think the lack of respect is maybe the biggest problem that, uh, that we are facing, the lack of respect towards nature, the lack of respect towards uh, other communities. And yeah, these are the two speakers. Big round of applause for them. Yeah, thank you so, so much for being here. And we are also extremely delighted to welcome Nat Vital here. Uh, Nat and I have uh, known each other since 1985. And uh, as a teenager, I visited Nat uh, in the Engadin and made my first studio visit. And already then, I realized uh, the incredible engagement with, with habitats, with nature, uh, with, with architecture, uh, in a very non-anthropocentric way. And so it connects very deeply to many of the things we are discussing here with Tammy. I uh, was always so amazed by Nott's uh, extremely expanded notion of art. And uh, uh, Nott is going to talk today about the idea also 
of mutual aid and how this topic actually is reflected uh, in the work in terms of uh, the founding of a school, which is part, of course, of Knott's uh, practice, but also the travels, uh, where there is a permanent notion also of exchange. So a very, very warm welcome to Knott Vital. <laughs> and we are also very delighted to welcome Refik Anadol here. Uh, Refik and I had uh, amazing conversations over the last couple of months, how many of these ideas of what we want to discuss here, how we want to live together in terms of environmental health, in terms of animal plants, fungi, uh, but also um, how important it actually is for that to pull the knowledge, you know, to go beyond the fear of pulling knowledge. And of course, Rafik does that as a media artist, as a director, uh, by using many different forms of new technology. And we're excited to hear more. Very warm welcome to Rafik Anadol. But as um, actually Mikola and I said, and it's actually um, uh, really important, I think, to mention that um, it's E-S-W-S-M. Everything really starts with Stefano Mancuso. And before it starts, yeah, and you know what started with Stefano Mancuso? It started that I met Salome Rodek, because um, that I will introduce now, uh, together with Moni Lola. Um, and uh, Salome and Moni Lola are both part of our team, of our curatorial team, of our scientific team. And um, uh, I met, as, as we said before, Salome because Stefano introduced me to Lynn Magulis. And then I asked our team in Berlin, find somebody that is a real expert in Lynn Magulis. And then um, I met Salome and I have to say that your contribution to our panel that Hans Ulrich was already referring to in Berlin couldn't be more important. And I also think that um, that uh, Lynn's thinking uh, influenced the way how you are also very much and how you're thinking and listening to you very often and to your take on, on, on the symbiotic planet is really something that, um, that is enlightening also my perspective. And Moni Lola, last but not least, she is the co-curator of this panel and the other panels that are coming today and tomorrow and also our workshops that I can already announce uh, uh, that we do tomorrow with the VSC Foundation and uh, Joseph Grimmer from Space Cavia, uh, from non-extractive to um, uh, regenerative architecture without your support, Munilola, and with your thoughts, uh, I definitely would, wouldn't be able to, uh, to prepare all of this. So thank you very much for that and a big round of applause. <laughs> So, yeah, we begin, uh, and uh, uh, Mikola and I thought it would be great to actually uh, maybe address some first questions uh, to Stefano, who has been an immense inspiration uh, for so many years, ever really since uh, Carsten Höller introduced us when uh, you and Carsten did this very large-scale experiment where almost 100,000 people yes. actually experimented in Florence, an experiment between art and science, but actually even before that, we were introduced in a very unexpected way uh, by the Swiss artist Daniel Spurry, who is, I think, yeah, he's in his late 80s, early 90s, and uh, lives in, um, Daniel Spurry lives in Vienna, and has started a very big garden uh, between sculpture and, uh, and basically forests and plants in, uh, in Italy. Uh, and he gave me your, your book. That's, uh, that was somehow the, the beginning and said, this is urgent. And uh, completely independent of that, of course, Mikolai and you started to have this very intense collaboration, right? Very intense collaboration. I, mean, I think uh, I, I can say, I said it yesterday uh, already at the dinner, um, that uh, Stefano's thinking became uh, a part of the identical code of our company. First Therma Art, then Therma Group is basically over... I mean, it was... We had always uh, the plant-based environments as an element of our interior because somehow people like to be in nature, yeah? So this is why our business model was so successful always. But uh, the deep meaning of it and the deep relevance, uh, probably also the relevance for the survival of our species on the planet, this is something that uh, uh, I had no idea about before Stefano. And then reading his books, seeing the sketches about plants that have eyes, that can see us, that can sense us, that know that uh, we are actually individual beings and that can uh, do a distinct 
distinction between different humans. And then this moment when we were um, sliding down the slides of Carsten Höller with the little baby bean plant in our hands, knowing that this baby bean plant knows me and knows that it's sliding and knows that uh, or doesn't like the sliding process and that you can really measure this feeling of the plant. And this is something that opened up for me a completely new world, a completely new world of um, uh, that, that I haven't seen. And, and this is a concept, Stefano, that you introduced to me, to the world, of so-called plant blindness, that we cannot see plant because we only see what we do with our own hands, but we cannot see the environment that we are born into. Please elaborate on this concept. Thank you. Uh, well, well, so, uh, uh, f f yes, we are completely blind to plant and uh, because plants are the, the, the life of the planet. Just start to, uh, to understand the numbers. We, uh, we look at the, at, at the planet from our point of view, that it's an animal point of view, of course, but we animals are just 0.3% of the biomass on the planet. So the biomass is the weight of the life. If we would be able to weight all the life on the planet, we animals, all the animals, not just humans, all the animals, all together, are just 0.3%. 85.5% of the life is made by plants. So the life on this planet, it's a green life. And without plants, anything would disappear. So the reason, just to put in another, in another way, uh, without plants, the earth, Will, would be exactly the same of the picture we are looking at coming from Mars. Same, exactly the same planet. We are not Mars because of the plant. So now that uh, we have clear this point, we need to understand also that we, are, we humans are destroying the engine of life at a rate that it's really uh, unbelievable to understand. We are, in the last two centuries, we cut down uh, 2,000 billions of trees. And just to give you an, uh, um, an example, now today we, we, uh, we talk about Amazonian forest as the last big forest, primary forest. Well, but we don't understand that at, at the, in the middle of the 19th century, so in 1850, was possible to travel from Palermo in Sicily to Oslo in Norway just without exiting um, never from a huge big forest. So in 1850, Europe, was all uh, was yet an entire primary forest. Today, in Europe, there are zero hectares of uh, primary forest. What mean, in other words, is all the forests you can see in Europe are not natural forests, are uh, forests that has been planted by humans. Okay, so uh, this is the the rate of the, the destruction is. Uh, is unbelievable. There is another, another uh, data that I want to share with you. 2020, in the future, will be remembered not because of the COVID, but will be, will be remembered for another uh, epochal uh, moment. In 2020, the weight of the materials produced by human plastic and concrete mostly, uh, were uh, able to um, overtake, is it, this is, a sub, is, is it's correct, the term, overtake the, the, the weight of the life. So today on the planet, there are more uh, material produced by humans with respect to the weight of the life. And this is something 
um, that was almost inconceivable until uh, 10 years ago. So I mean, uh, there is a, an exponential growth of what we are doing. Uh, the, um, China is producing each year the same amount of concrete that U.S. used in the last century. So just to give you an, an amount, the, the, the idea of what we are doing, and uh, all that is related to, um, in my opinion, to the, uh, the problem that we don't, don't understand how life works. Life uh, is, uh, I was very, uh, very happy to understand that the, uh, the, the, the Danish pavilion was uh, uh, dedicated to the contact, to, to the connection. Because life is a matter of relationship, is a matter of a connection. And, uh, and this is why uh, Lynn Margulis and uh, the works on symbiosis it's uh, of a paramount importance because life is a symbiosis. Our body is made by hundreds of thousands, I would say, of different species. Maybe you know that the, the number of bacterial cells in our body, it's more than the number of human cells. But we are humans. We cannot be humans without bacterial cells. The same is, uh, the same works at any scale on the life. There is no possibility to survive alone. And now the second, um, sorry if I'm taking too, too no, much no, time. No, no, please. No, this, yeah, is this is wonderful. wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> okay. it's, it's so wonderful. This is yeah. a great the, introduction. Uh, yeah. the, the second point, this is also to, to, to have a, a, a framework of what is happening to this planet in my vision. Um, the second point is that we are, uh, we human, we are changing the way we, we, we live normally. So I, I, what I mean is that we are becoming a urban species. This is something also quite relevant. Um, in, uh, um, today, in uh, Europe, US, and uh, a big part of Asia, between 70 and 80% of people live in urban environment. And this is also something completely new. I mean, 50 years ago, the relationship was the complete opposite. So, 70, so I mean, 70% of the people were living outside of the town. So in a very short time, in a very short period of time, we changed, we revolution the way we live. Today we are an urban species. And what's meant to be an urban species? Well, this is something that is changing our, uh, uh, our speech, really our speeches. Now uh, the towns are an ecological niche. So we are, a sp we are specialized. We are a species specialized to live in town. And this is, this is changing everything. I mean, um, because uh, 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 a specialized species is very efficient until the, the environment that they choose is maintained stable. But when something changes, even small variations, the, uh, the ability to survive of a specialized species, it's very low. The, uh, so we are, now we have a very, in a, in a really dangerous situation because we, we became a specialized species and our environment is very far, in, is changing in a very fast way. How fast? This is, uh, the, the, the point that probably uh, is not so very well known. In uh, um, just in uh, the, the most optimistic models say that in uh, 2070, so in 50 years, the uh, the climate 
the average temperature of Venice will be the average temperature of today, Catania, in Sicily. Okay, that it's 1,100 kilometers south of Venice. And, in, uh, and uh, Rome, in 2070, uh, will uh, uh, we'll have um, uh, a climate very similar to Tunisia. And Catania, in Sicily, will become uh, um, a sub-Sahel uh, town. In other words, in 2070, 18% of the surface of the earth that is today habitated, uh, um, habitated by, by human will be completely uh, unuseful. So can, will not be able to host life. On this 80% of the, of, the, of the earth lives two billions of people today. So it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. So by far, this is the biggest problem that humanity had in the, in, uh, during its history. is nothing less of that. And, uh, and the solutions that we are providing are completely unuseless. Um, just, so there is one data. You, you have to look just at one data. There is, all the rest is completely uh, unuseful. Just Google CO2 today and look at the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Look at the curve and look at the, at the pattern and put on the pattern the date of uh, the, 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 the several COP21, COP22, 25, and, and so on. And you will see that nothing happens. Nothing. So the CO2 is increasing uh, uh, at a rate that it's faster and faster. And everything that has been suggested until today has nothing to do with the, de with the decreasing of CO2. They, all the solutions are about producing less CO2. So I mean, this is something uh, that we, are, we need to understand. So the problems that we are going to, to, to solve require that we decrease the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. What we, are, what, are, what we are doing is just to increase a little bit lesser. And you will never decrease the CO2 by increasing lesser. So if for a miracle tomorrow uh, we, will became, we, we will travel with electrical uh, uh, auto, uh, and using uh, solar power and recyclable uh, energy, and we all became vegetarians, all, all the planet tomorrow, the CO2 would always increasing. So we did nothing. If something like this will happen, nothing happens to the CO2. It's just, the, the, the CO2 will, will follow to increase. So what we, what, what we have to do is to, to decrease the CO2. What is the solution to decrease CO2? It's planting tree. Yes. Uh, because I was just, uh, I wanted to suggest going to Mars is still an uh, alternative, right? Uh, going to Mars, yes, without plant. As in, uh, yes, as in any, in, a repre in, in any representation of a human settlement on outside of Earth, there are no plant. So, because I wanted, before you come to the solution, I wanted to make a point that I think is deeply, deeply rooted in our cultural practice. And this is how, actually, how important it is that culture and nature are starting to talk with each other. And I wanted also to use this occasion to welcome, uh, with a big round of applause, Joseph Grimmer. Um, <laughs> 
Joseph, uh, we are doing tomorrow the uh, actually, and, and this is so much on topic, this the workshop about non-extractive architecture. This is his uh, recent publication that will be also published um, and presented tomorrow. It's another very urgent book. Uh, it's a, it's so a very urgent book. Very uh, responding to exactly some yeah. of the ideas. And Stefano, of course, uh, is also um, present, as Mikolai said, with an installation in uh, the Biennale. And uh, I thought it was very interesting uh, because when I read the title uh, yesterday, I realized that you use a ti the title of, uh, of Kopotkin's book, no? of The Mutual Aid, uh, a book which has been a lot quoted uh, uh, actually uh, lately, a 1902 collection. It had originally come out actually in a periodical, the 19th century, between 1890 and 1896. And it's interesting because, of course, it explores um, uh, yeah, mutually beneficial cooperation and reciprocity, yeah. or as he calls it, mutual aid. Uh, among humans, but also among animals. But it doesn't talk that much about plants. It doesn't talk about... So I was very curious about this title, if you could introduce a little bit the, the enormous research you have made and how it also connects to what you've just said, to which extent maybe also mutual aid can help us to find solution. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I am. So we have the false idea that uh, life proceeded through competition. Uh, this is uh, something that we learned from uh, the, uh, let's say, Charles Darwin heirs. But it's not a Charles Darwin idea. And, uh, um, but competition is not the main uh, force of evolution. Uh, the main force of evolution is cooperation. And cooperation is uh, even... Uh, more important in a stressful environment. So when there is, a, uh, when, the, when the, the, the environment is not perfect, so then it's the, it's the, it's the moment when cooperation works much better. This is, it, it's not a okay, case, it's not by chance that Kropotkin wrote uh, the mutual aid as a factor of evolution. This is the, the complete title of the book. When he was in Siberia, so in a very stressful environment where uh, uh, he was able to understand how the cooperation among uh, uh, living organisms was uh, giving all that organisms the ability, the possibility to survive. And so I think that uh, cooperation is, a, is, a, is another of the uh, two of the possibility that we have. Uh, this is why uh, uh, we did the, the installation of mutual aid, it's, it's, a, it's really a demonstration of how mutual aid works. It's, it's an installation based on plants that are purifying the air that we breathe. And uh, we, can, we can see, we can breathe that air, we can, we can see the, uh, the amount of uh, um, pollutants in real time, that in real time is uh, filtered by, by the plant, and this is, this is what, what I mean by, by mutual aid. We are uh, cooperating together, and again, is a, is a, an evolution of, uh, of, I would say, not, not an evolution, it's exactly the same idea of Lynn Margulis and, uh, and, uh, and James Lovelock, the, that everything is interconnected, and that we can live all uh, just if we can uh, maintain the richness of the speeches. And sorry, I, I just introduced this other uh, subject that I, I feel it's, it's, a, it's, it's of, of paramount importance. We are losing an, an incredible number of speeches. And, uh, and probably many of you uh, have heard that we are in the middle of the sixth extinction, but probably not so many know that the five extinction that precede this sixth extinction were natural extinction. And this one is a human-based extinction. And what does this mean? That let's take the last one, probably the, 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 the fifth extinction is the one that all of we know very well, is the, me, the meteorite uh, destroying all the dinosaurs. Well, this is a, a movie 
uh, idea. Okay. The meteorite effectively fall in, in Yucatan, but the dinosaurs extinct, uh, uh, getting extincted in the, in the five millions after. So um, a very fast extinction event last million of years, a very fast extinction event. Now we have the same amount of species disappearing, but in few decades. And this is something completely new that never happens on the, on the earth. And there is no time for the nature, to, to, for the life to, to rearrange themselves. Yes, so um, coming back to the first concept that we introduced from you, the plant blindness, I think it's very important to highlight that uh, we can, until we understand this concept, we can see only culture. We are here in Venice, just to give you an example, a city built on 10 million of trees that were taken out from the coast and from the islands of Croatia. And back then, when this happened, until today, nature never recovered. So the ecosystems on the coast of Croatia collapsed because of this city was built on trees by the Venetians. We are admiring this city. It's one of the most important expressions of human culture and architecture. And it's a city that um, incorporated the flowers and the plants only in the ornamentics. And this is very interesting because I think, Hans Ulrich, this is exactly the point where we need to incorporate nature following Stefano Mancuso's concepts into, um, in, into the culture. So culture has to completely open up for nature. And I think it's exactly the right moment to introduce Maya Hoffmann that uh, now finally came. Please bring, a, bring another chair. A very warm welcome to Maya Hoffmann. Why it's such a good moment? Because Maya's research center. <laughs> no, no, uh, you're already the second panelist that comes after. So it's a coming and going, as you say. But Maya Hoffmann's research center, the Luma Foundation, is actually exactly an example of connectivity between culture and nature. It's a research center from the perspective of culture incorporating so many different uh, projects. Very much so, and also the idea of breakfast this morning, you know, when um, Stefano, Mancusa, Stefano Mancuso talked at breakfast about, he told us that we should uh, think about a city really based on plants, a plant city, you know, and uh, that leads us to urbanism. And uh, in addition to the wonderful introduction Mikola made uh, to Maya, I would also like to introduce Maya as an urbanist, because I think there is a very important aspect of uh, transformation of a city and plants, as we know, play a very big role in what Maya does in AL with Atelier Luma. Uh, so there is a deep connection there as well, I think. I think both Stefano and Maya are urbanists. Maybe we should before, um, Asking Maya some questions, I thought it would be good one question to Stefano about this idea of the plant city, because I think it's a nice transition. We also this morning, I actually had another thought this morning in breakfast. I was thinking if 85% um, uh, is plants, and we are such, you know, there's just few of us in comparison, um, and then we read about your idea of the nation of plants and the right of plants, um, in that sense, Stefano should really be the Prime Minister of Italy. Uh, yes. Or, <laughs> not only or, of Italy. Uh, or yes. should run Europe. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> anyway, no, but... Uh, if, 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 if plant would be able to vote, probably I have some possibility, some chance. <laughs> that it's, a, it's a long way before giving right <laughs> to plants. But can you well, tell us about yeah. the plant urbanism? Because it's yeah. a nice transition, I think, to, yes, I mean, to the Atelier this is, Luma and to Al. Yes. Uh, uh, the, 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 look at the... If, I don't know if you have, uh, if you have a present the, that painting of Renaissance uh, depicting the ideal city. Uh, we had three or four... Three, no? Uh, uh, three uh, uh, paintings of the ideal city in Renaissance, and all that paint uh, without any living organisms, nothing. It's just architecture. 
It's a wonderful architecture, but pure architecture. And this is, even today, the idea of the, the town for us. So it's a very primitive idea. This is something that go back to our first settlement when we, we started to make our first house. Uh, the second thing that we did was to, to build a wall or, or, or something to separate the internal uh, of the town that was the place of the human from outside, that was the place of the nature. Um, so we, we are following on this idea of division uh, between uh, the internal and the external of the town that it's a nonsense. So the, the, in my, uh, my opinion is that the, um, the internal and the external of the town should be completely fluid, not possible to, to detect. So in other words, we need to bring back to, to the town the nature and mostly the plant but not just putting a plant in, uh, in the park, in the gardens, along the road, in the gardens. No, I, I mean a new town where everything is covered by plant. Everything is under the plant, where the plants are inside of the buildings. Did you ask yourself why there are no plants indoor? Why in our hospital, in our schools, in our office? There are no plants, and I mean, when I, when I, when I, when I talk of plants, I'm not speaking about the, the potos or the, or the ficus in the corner. <laughs> eh? Nothing. There is nothing. Why? It's a nonsense again. Again, it costs nothing, and the number of advantages of bringing plant with us, it's huge. So there is a, an incredible scientific literature about. So we need to, so we need to change the idea. And uh, my suggestion is to, to, to go back to another, uh, there is another botanic urbanist, one of probably of the, of the biggest, uh, the first, I would say, urbanist, serious urbanist, was Patrick Giddes. Uh, uh, he was a botanist. I don't know how many know about that. But he was a botanist, and, uh, and it was the first that st suggested to look at the, at, the, at the town from the point of view of a living organism. And as I was saying to you before, a living organism is something, it's, it's not a, a single one. It's a symbiosis, it's a community. We are, our body, it's a community of uh, so many species. And, uh, the town, the, uh, the cities, are as a living organisms, and we need to provide all the richness of uh, as many species as we can. So, and, and just another, just two percent of the surface of the earth is covered by by, by town today. Uh, from this two percent of surface came. 80% of the CO2, 80% of the waste, and uh, this 2% of the surface consume 80% of resources of a herd. So it's clear that if we want to solve the environmental problems, we need to work on the town, on the cities. And this is a, some, in, in a way, um, a change of, a, of, a, of a perspective because we, when we think about solving the environmental problems, we normally think about protecting forests, and this is, of course, something that we have to do. But to solve the environmental problems, we have to change the idea of the town, how our town are made. We cannot afford anymore to have 80% of CO2 produced by, ta by town. And how can we stop all this CO2? Again, by using trees. And I mean, trees are the only thing on the planet, on the earth, that is able to, took, to take CO2 from the atmosphere and to put on, on, on the wood and on the soil. And uh, so this is the solution. We, we have the data. We know how many trees we have to put. 
one, one, one thousand billion trees is not so, so, so much. Is not so much. Eh? Is not so much. We have, the, we have the place, we have the money, and, uh, and this we, we would change everything. Are you proposing we throw away the existing and we start anew? <laughs> no. Well, well, I would throw away most of them, uh, uh, but not Venice, for example. <laughs> uh, 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 but yes, the, the, the idea uh, is uh, to, to, to work on the existing cities. Yes, more than um, producing a new one. No, so th the first thing is not to produce any more cities because uh, we are, we are, we are uh, uh, or if we have to, to produce new cities, they must be really done in a completely different way. For example, without, with, without you, not using a concrete. Concrete, concrete. Is the co uh, is for the production of concrete, we produce between 30 and 40 percent of the CO2 every year. So we produce 30, 40 percent of the CO2 because of the concrete. So it's it's a, it's an insane. Uh, so Andrew, if you remember, and that's the topic of. This is his topic, but you know, and uh, we, we called the Berlin conference from building Bauhaus to growing Gaia. Yeah, and um, I remember Maya when we were on the panel in, in Basel, the city of artists was the name of the panel. It was quite interesting because Maya uh, said that here in this uh, context of art, we can become activists because I think there is a political dimension to what we are speaking, there's a cultural dimension. And there is a um, there is a scientific dimension, and you just highlighted uh, Stefano the scientific dimension that you also showed us in the Arsenale in an absolutely beautiful way. In the I mutual aid, which is in the mutual aid, the title for today's uh, for this conference. You're right; it is the direct uh, link also to 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 Luma because, of course, uh, Luma Al brings together environment and culture in such an amazing way and it's an exciting moment where it all comes together because it's uh, 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 very related I think also in terms for example of what we discussed earlier today with collaborative working, with mutual aid, with constellations, with also flexible spaces it has a lot to do uh, with what Stefano said, for example, we were thinking this morning at breakfast, what you did with algae or what you do with algae at Atelier Luma is very connected. And to also the, with concrete actually. Exactly. We can have uh, concrete that is much more alive, and uh, yeah, I mean we are only in the research phase, so it's very difficult to get out into the world at large with all these new products. But many, many people are working on this all over the world, and uh, I'm quite confident that we can uh, at least um, optimize what has been done up to now. And when I said become an activist, it was like three years ago, and uh, I've stayed active during COVID. <laughs> yeah, this morning fighting COVID, is going to test took me like one hour more than I thought, but so only to excuse my my um, delay. Um, yeah, we 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 can start to to work on everything with the scientists. I think this is what is happening with Atelier Luma when you speak about Al. Uh, since four years, we have been really um, investing in research, in doing things differently. The algae, yeah, uh, the rice, how to use it in in, uh, uh, in building walls instead of concrete. The floors are different. And I must say that before I speak about the garden or the atelier, when we will be opening on the 26th um, of uh, June this year, still with some COVID uh, rules. And then later on, as of the 1st of July in France, uh, there are less, um, lesser rules, hopefully. Uh, we can show some of these materials inside of the building of Gary. So actually you have a, a, a huge, a huge architect who has been criticized quite often for, for uh, wasting resources, but we, he's much more like an artist in this case. And with the atelier and with our, our, our knowledge that is only, only really starting, it's, 
we, we were able to include materials which can be really interesting to see in this building because it shows what the, the application that is possible for them. Um, what was the question, Hans? Yeah, can you maybe tell us more about, it's such an amazing role, uh, in a way, case study and role model is, is, is the Atelier Luma for what we're discussing. Can you tell us a little bit about the genesis and how it was born and how it evolved and what it does now? Because there is also a, a whole new building, uh, a whole new environment is being created for it as we speak. Yeah, uh, for the future of Atelier yeah. Luma. Yeah. yeah, so as I said, we, it's a research, it was a research station that is um, first started out mapping the, um, the environment. So it, it is uh, designed in a bioregion. Um, there are some, some people who were instrumental in the program that are sitting here, like Maria uh, and, um, and um, Jan Völlen, who is um, curating the Lithuanian pavilion here, and who couldn't come today. Uh, they are leading this atelier. They are really research workers. But at the same time, I must say, the Luma Foundation that I created in 2004, already in 2004 was, um, was uh, underlining the importance of environment, human rights, and art, where art could be, as we speak about activism, could be activating all this uh, humanistic uh, approach of the world and holistic. And the Atelier Luma is really, uh, really the, 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 yeah, the, the incarnation of this thinking. Um, we've been working really for years and so close uh, every day. So I am a little, mm. probably the last person who can have the bird's view about what we are doing. But uh, I must say we are getting more and more uh, partnerships, demands. And so we, yeah, from the experimental, how do you go into a, a model? We know we are sustainable. We know we, we, we are resilient with the materials. We know that we do, we, we, we do our social impact. We work with the people from the region because the people are as important as the plants, in my view. Yeah, but that's, yeah. So that's really, really what it is about. But how do you make a um, business model out of it? This, hopefully, uh, will happen also as organically as the rest has happened. Otherwise, I don't think it will be sustainable. That's a very good point. So I, I want to use exactly this moment of activism because it's, uh, it's, it resonates still in me, what you said back then, to introduce you to an activist, Nina Gualinga, <laughs> that actually um, has an incredible story. And I think her perspective, you weren't here when we introduced the panel. So she's actually um, coming from the Amazonian region. And, um, and Nina, you have to tell your story, what happened at COP21 and how you turned from being um, assessed as a terrorist or as a, you know, as a, a, into coming um, as an example how we have to do things differently. Because I think there's an important element, uh, uh, what Maya just said, is that as we are humans, we cannot restore nature without humans. And the communities that are actually on the forefront, if you want to say, of ecosystem conservation are as important as the potential communities that we have to build for the ecosystem restoration. And I think between the restoration and the conservation, based on truthful business models, also fair and just business models, this will be the big, because we cannot do the job without humans, yeah? So it's uh, humans need to learn to see plants, but uh, we also need to learn to, um, to do this, and we can learn it actually from the humans that, uh, that are already doing it. And uh, as Nina um, is one of them, and we are super happy that you are here and that you can give us this perspective, that I think is an extremely valuable perspective for us. Um, well, thank you so much, and thank you for the space. Um, so, yes, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to who I am and uh, what I do, and we'll then uh, talk about, you know, what we're talking about here. Um, I am from the Quechua people of Sarayaku in the Ecuadorian Amazon. So I grew up in an indigenous community. My mother is uh, Quechua indigenous, um, and my father is actually Swedish. Um, he's a scientist, a biologist, so... 
um, very involved in climate matters as well, so got that perspective and also um, the indigenous uh, lived experiences and indigenous perspective. Um, so I guess I just want to start off by um, telling how important the territory is for indigenous people. The territory is everything because the territory is life and by territory I mean our land, our forest, um, the rivers, the mountains, the lagoons, everything. Um, and uh, the way that we live and see and our cosmovision is we are one. Okay, so humans, animals, uh, even the minerals under the ground, um, the trees, the plants, the stones, the water, everything is one because we as humans are nature itself. We come from nature, we go back to nature when we die, we are nature. Um, and when, when this is interrupted, this oneness or this connectivity or um, when that is interrupted, that is when imbalance comes. So I will speak from my personal experience of this. Um, in my community, we drink the water directly from the streams, from the rivers. Uh, we plant our own food, our houses. I don't know if I saw that the, some of the photos were um, circling here before. Maybe you can put them up so um, you might just have an idea of what it looks like. There are no roads to my community. We don't have electricity, although in the recent years, some families do have solar panel. Um, there is no phone signal. Um, we transport by walking in the forest or canoe. We hunt, we fish, and um, we communicate with the land. Um, so when I was, yes, that's, that's where I live. That's my house. <laughs> um, that's actually, yeah, that's the roof of my house. Um, so when I was eight years old, um, I had been living there in my community my entire life, and this was the life that I knew. Um, an Argentinian oil company came to my community without informing, without our consent, um, and they basically, you know, entered the community with helicopters, and when the leaders of my community said, no, we do not want oil exploitation in our territory because that will pollute our rivers, it will destroy the future of our children, it will completely imbalance everything that we know and, and our life. Um, the Ecuadorian government sent out heavily armed military to harass and threaten our people. Many of my own family and friends were tortured, threatened, um, and persecuted politically. And um, we, as a community, as you know, the small community in the Ecuadorian Amazon that nobody cares about, that no one knows about, um, and you know, we resisted this. And the women of my community said, no, we will not let the oil companies destroy our land because this land is the legacy of our ancestors. This land is the legacy that we will leave to our children for their survival and their um, existence. So we fought really hard legally in national court, international court, we fought through media and communication, we fought literally, um, you know, facing the military out in the forest. And I can tell you this, there was not one person in my community that wasn't involved in this resistance. From the smallest children to, you know, the oldest people in our community were involved. We had pregnant women fighting off the military in the forest. Um, and the people basically organized in peace camps out in the forest because we did not want to have violent confrontations. We believe that, you know, we wanted to resist peacefully. But as you were saying, um, 
the government was painting my people up as guerrilla, as terrorists, as an obstacle for development of the country, um, and to turn the public opinion against us. Um, so we, you know, had to come up with really smart ways to to show that that was not the case. We were not being violent. The violent people was the oil companies and the military. Um, and at one point, um, you know, they the, the, the oil companies, they buried 1,400 kilograms of high explosive pentalites in our grounds, in the forest where we hunt, where we walk, where we plant our food. Um, they cut down our sacred trees. For us, the trees, you've probably seen Avatar, right? That is a movie, but for us, our trees hold the spirits of our ancestors. Um, I get really emotional. They are family. They hold the wisdom. They hold our story, right? So maybe for an extractive company, that doesn't mean anything to cut down the tree. But the tree is the source of life for everything. As I said, it's our history, but it has so many layers to it. From all the baby birds that are born in the tree, to all the oxygen that the tree provides, to the roots that nourish and holds the ground, to all the animals that eat the fallen fruits. You know, it's a whole system. It's amazing. But when we look at trees, or when you know someone goes into the forest, we just see trees, but we don't see all the life around it or everything that it holds, that it's a whole world itself, that it holds life. So, you know, these sacred trees for us that you know hold the spirits of our ancestors, that hold the spirits that balance our life, is painful. It's painful. And I, you know, I feel it, and I felt that as a child. So um, after this experience, we, you know, 10 years later, we won a legal battle in the Inter-American uh, Court of Human Rights, where they basically recognized that, you know, our rights as indigenous people had been violated. Um, the government had to publicly apologize to the people um, so that was, you know, a victory, but it took us 10 years to get there. Um, and we were one community. What I'm talking about right now happened back then when I was eight years old, and it continues to happen every day, and it happens today. And people, you know, indigenous people that live off the land, that defend the Amazon rainforest, but not just the Amazon rainforest, you know, up in the north and in, in the Nordic countries, um, in Americas, everywhere are targeted, are being murdered, raped, persecuted, harassed, displaced. Um, this is reality and this is what I see every day of my life. And the reason why I have decided to, you know, dedicate my life to protecting those areas, you know, voicing what is happening, talking about indigenous rights, talking about land rights, is because, you know, I experienced that in my life. Um, and I actually, I want to tie it to, I, th I thought it was really interesting that you were saying that 80% um, of this uh, CO2 is produced by um, cities. Um, so indigenous people make up 4% of the world's population and um, protect more than 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. That means something. That, that really shows where we are as humans. And for doing that, for protecting that, for protecting land, water, animals and plants, we are being murdered, we are being displaced, we are being, you know, incarcerated. Um, and I think that it's really important 
that we understand these relationships and these dynamics, right? How these companies that come to indigenous territories destroy, you know, in many places they have already destroyed land and forests. They destroy forests. They violate our rights as people. They violate our bodies and, and our lives. And then the very same companies are also the ones that are, so to say, destroying the planet, that are causing climate change, that are, you know, putting out all these um, carbon emissions in, in the air. Um, so another layer to that is last year, the same day as Ecuador um, you know, announced state of emergency and a national lockdown completely. The same day, a massive flood hit my community and various other communities along the river basin and other rivers. Um, this had never happened before. We are used to floods, you know, they come every 10 to 15 years, they wash away some things. It's part of the cycle. But this, you know, we had seen many small changes coming in nature. Um, and uh, this massive flood washed away half of my community, washed away the schools, the bridge, destroyed all our crops and our food. Um, and for the first time, you know, that's my family said, for the first time we have felt what it's like to go hungry. This is in the Amazon rainforest, in the most biodiverse place on Earth, where we get everything that we need from the forest. They walked around hungry for months because, you know, nature has a cycle. It takes time to grow food again. And this massive flood is a direct, you know, consequence of deforestation and climate change. So first you have these companies coming, violating our territories, our bodies, our rights, causing climate change. And the first people that are impacted by climate change are the people that live closely to the land, indigenous people. So there is, you know, so many layers to this. And I also want to add that, um, you know, a lot of climate change and you know the issues that we're facing globally today you know in some degree come from colonization it comes from you know the displacement of local people living there grabbing that land controlling it exploiting it taking out the fossil fuels from the ground because most places you know where there is fossil fuels is on indigenous land taking that out you know, burning that, putting that up into the air, that is where climate change comes from. And I think that we often, we don't see that, we don't realize that, that the problems that are coming us, you know, that we're facing today comes from the violation of, of rights of indigenous people, of killing and displacing. Um, so where do we look for answers? We have to look for the answers from the people that do not only protect land and biodiversity and forest, but that are also the first ones impacted and most impacted by this system, because it is a system. Um, and, you know, one of the things that my community after this experience and connecting this globally, because you know this this happened in my community, but it happens all over the world, and it you know it repeats in the same way in worse ways. Um, what we have been proposing to the world, what we have been you know trying to bring a message to different spaces and at COP, you know, climate negotiations is how do we reconnect to the land? 
because as you were saying, you know, these cities and, you know, the world has, we have built our cities as if we are not part of the land. We have built them as if we are, you know, foreign and to nature. And it's interesting because in my language and in many indigenous languages, there is no word for nature. We don't need it because it's we are part of it. Yeah. Um, did you did you see? Excuse me. Did you do you feel that your government could have helped you to move uh, your um, story forward? Um, there is so Ecuador, like you know, the most BMP of Ecuador is dependent on the extraction of uh, oil. So they work directly against us, and they were also the Thank ones you. that sent the military. Sorry for to, the interruption. Yeah. Thanks. No. <laughs> but it's an interesting question because it, it raises the question then also of mutual aid, uh, in terms of the you know in terms of the topic. And I'm very interested because you you are the co-founder of Haku Amazon de Design, and um, uh, this initiative uh, you know which uh, creates opportunities, uh, really um, uh, manifold opportunities for indigenous women in the Ecuadorian Amazon and beyond. And I just wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about the mutual aid in this group and also um, what we can do to support this group. Thank you. Um, well, so I've actually been, yeah, I've been, let me take it from the beginning. So during you know my work with different indigenous communities, I've been working a lot with indigenous women. And, you know, I started seeing the different challenges they face and, you know, all these different layers that I was going through. Of course, we as indigenous people, we face them collectively. We experience them collectively, as do women. But there is another layer to that that women experience, and it's gender violence. And it's the extractive industries affect indigenous women in very specific ways and you know very specific for indigenous women and we have seen that throughout um, you know places not just in South America but other places where the extractive industries are um, they target women because women are you know the life bearers the carriers of life the, the they transmit the knowledge and, you know, women are often in our small indigenous societies, the backbones of our societies. So women are affected and targeted, you know, in very specific ways, sexual violence, um, you know, gender violence. And a lot of the extractive industries also come with many like socioeconomic problems that also impact women um, very heavily. So we started working with indigenous women in many ways and that you know that was through like giving um also alternative economic income for their dependents and so that you know they can continue their leadership as defenders of the amazon rainforest um and i actually kind of want to you know go into a, a very important topic and that is that you know the the exploitation and destruction of the land and the earth is based on the idea of ownership, of control and exploitation, use and abuse. Um, and I think that for many women globally, that is something that we as women experience as well, control. So there is a link between that. And for indigenous women, that link is even stronger because for us, our territory and our body is one. So a violation of our body is a violation of our territory and a violation of our territory is a violation of our bodies. Um, and that is what I have been working with indigenous women that are taking leadership, that are saying no to mining companies, you know, logging companies, um, oil companies, and that have been targeted. I have had women in my family being attacked being threatened, like having their lives literally threatened. Um, and women across the Ecuadorian Amazon experiencing these very same things. So the things that I'm talking about are very real. They impact our lives in very real ways. And indigenous people are facing these things on a daily basis because we protect 
life, we are targeted by companies and by governments. That is reality. Yeah, first of all, a big round of applause because... Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I, I mean, I have to say thank you not only for protecting the land, but also for protecting something else uh, that was very clear when you were speaking. You, you, you're protecting our perception. You're protecting how we actually should see nature. You're protecting a kind of mindset for all of us that you can bring back here just with your words and everybody can feel it because you are saying it. But it's something that we have forgotten. I mean, Stefano was talking all the time about exactly the relevance of this mindset, the relevance of seeing ourselves as one with the nature, but you protected it by living it. You know, this is, we, we talked at the breakfast today, Stefano, that uh, when you do a drawing of a plant, you understand the plant much better because your hand was drawing the plant, you know. And obviously you understand it even much, much better when you are living it the way how you live. So thank you very much for protecting this picture. And I think we have to go back into these pictures and we have to meditate about them. We have to go back into these places and we have to meditate with you because these companies are destroying because they don't understand life. They just don't get it, yeah? They don't have this perspective. And I think to bring this perspective back to our world is maybe the most important um, uh, thing that we have to do. Because if we don't change the mindset, we can have so many plans and so many uh, data and facts, but we never will be able to change the course. Yeah, it's really thank you so, so much to, to, uh, uh, for your both presentations. I think there are so many connections now to Joseph also in terms of Joseph's new book of the non-extractive um, uh, architecture. But before moving on to Joseph, I had this question um, for Nina about, because we were with um, actually Cecilia Vicuña on a, on a panel the other day, and Cecilia said what is so important in terms uh, of initiatives, uh, uh, as you just described, uh, and the urgency of them, is that we find ways globally to support them. So I just wanted to very concretely, pragmatically know what can we do to support your collective. I forgot <laughs> that. Because that was the second part <laughs> of my question. Too and, modest. Uh, and it really, I think it's really important, you yeah. know? So, um, I actually want to add something. I'm sorry if I'm taking up too much time, but uh, I also want to um, just add that not everything is, you know, sad and horrible. And I, I, I just want to end this also talking about the beauty, the beauty of it because I think that's, you know, that's what inspires me and I think that's also what inspires other people. And um, I think there is so much knowledge in indigenous people and people in general that live so closely to the land and that there is so much to learn. Um, and, you know, one of the ways that uh, my community has been um, advocating for, you know, returning back to, to the roots and returning back to, you know, our what we are, our nature, um, is through, uh, you know, a concept called the living forest and tiam. Tiam means the, you know, the return. It means transformation. It means infinity. After this, this battle with the oil companies, you know, we had been labeled as these like guerrilla terrorists and everything. And, you know, my community had this vision to protect the territory and truly show that we were doing this peacefully and that we were doing it, you know, we were protecting life itself. Um, we decided to plant, because we have 300, uh, 330, no, like 500,000 acres of pristine rainforest. So we decided to plant trees, flowering trees around the entire um, territory so that when you fly over and this is, you know, a project that's from now to 50 years. We, we won't see it yet. But when you fly over the Amazon, you will be able to see the border. And the border is called the border of life because we protected that territory of life, you know, putting our lives in danger, risking our lives. And, you know, that's just like a beautiful symbol of, of you know, we are peaceful people that are fighting peacefully, but, you know, we're not really understanding each other with, you know, the companies and, and the governments. Um, and what my people is proposing is that 
in the policy making, you know, talking about climate change, talking about, you know, environmental policies, the rights of nature, etc., that we, you know, um, include this vision or this understanding of our relationship to nature, of our relationship to the land, you know, and all the different elements, that we include that and that we, instead of, or simultaneously, you know, looking for new technology and looking for new ways, you know, for renewable energy, that simultaneously we also go back to the ancient wisdom, to that ancient knowledge that indigenous people continue to carry and pass on through experience from generation to generation. Even if it hasn't been proved by science, you know, hardcore Western science, it has been proven by experience and life and it has been sustainable. Obviously, if we have sustained forests more than any other societies or cultures in the world, that, that itself is a proof that it's working. So, you know, what we're proposing is the tiam, the return, going back to this profound understanding of we are nature and that we should look for solutions in that ancient ancestral knowledge, but in a respectful way, you know? And I think probably Jan will talk about it, but in a respectful way. So, going back to... What would you propose us to do? So what 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 can you do? Um, um, is there are many ways, you know, there are many ways to 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 support it can it's a governmental um, you know level and and you know corporation level, but directly what indigenous people need is you know support in opening up spaces, having our voices heard, our rights respected. By respecting indigenous people's rights and lives and territories, we are protecting nature itself um, and funding. In order for us to continue our battles, we need resources. That is super important. This is maybe just because we will have it tomorrow as a topic, but, but isn't it absurd that they are basically um, preserving our most important resources for free? I mean, that we haven't this priced into our economic system. That's Kate Rivers' point. This is That's exactly. why we need the donut economics. Yeah. Uh, and we already said that that should be the topic of another conference. Is well, it should come from the companies. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I think that's uh, one response. COP26. COP26, we need to put it on the table. We have the Institute of Climate uh, Protection here also with us, tomorrow also on the panel. We need to have the green bonds and the CO2 offset emission system in a way that it's benefiting these people directly that are doing basically the, the symbiotic um, work with the nature. Well, how many people in your community? In my community since 10 years. Um, you started yeah. 10 years ago? Um, well, no, no I've lived my entire life. <laughs> no, but specifically in my community, we're 2,000 people. But across the Amazon, you know, we have hundreds, thousands of people. There are 400 different yeah. people. And like, everybody speaks to everybody? No, no, we don't. Okay. okay. Nina, at the moment, uh, who own the, the property of the land where you live? Sorry? The, 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 who own the land? Who owns? Who owns? We own it as indigenous you. people. Uh, yeah. So may I propose to use your foundation or your organization to buy other other lands? I think and taking care of them. Yes, I think the, the cost of the forest is nothing. I think this it's, is this is yeah. one. Uh, yeah, the value yeah. is great. The values is it's huge, but the cost is nothing. So I mean, the cost of the forest is just of the trees; they are uh, hosting. Yeah. And nothing more. I think there is different um, different communities and different indigenous people in different la um, um, countries ha have different realities. So in Ecuador, in my region, we own the land collectively. Yeah. So we le we are the legal owners of the land, and we they didn't give this for us to free. We did a national march in 1992, and you know paralyzed the country in order to get this. But that was the way we had to do it. Um, but for example, 
you know, if we're talking like here in Europe, there are indigenous people in Europe, we just don't know about it. They actually don't own the land. We have logging companies owning the land of indigenous people. So that is actually, in this case, that could be a great solution of buying the land and giving it back to indigenous yeah. people. But what I was suggesting you is not just to, to, to buy the land where you live, because this is already your, to buy other lands, other piece of forest. And because you know how to protect and how to manage the forest and the cost of the forest is nothing and in comparison with the, with the value. And I think that uh, this could be something where to find funding would be very easy. Yeah, I mean, that this is yeah. the future of... But Jean, um, actually, Nina is here because of Jean, um, and Jean is working um, with many communities, and there is an imbalance. Yeah, so uh, there is an imbalance in in the way that we established extremely unjust relationships. This was just an example of an extremely unjust relationships where this community is doing the life supporting uh, work for us not only preserving the you know culture the mentality the the um, uh, um, habitus and gestus towards nature but also very real to preserve the nature without having a system in place that is uh, uh, giving any kind of reward for this in contrary uh, in reward for this uh, we are giving suppression yeah, so I, I would like to introduce Jean and and maybe if you could say some works, uh, some words uh, from your experience with this kind of relationships um, and how you are trying in your practice. So Jean is working um, as a fashion facilitator, uh, but facilitating also um, the heritage of other cultures and uh, transforming it uh, to connect with with, with our realms. What what is your um, experience on the as as a connector of the different worlds that, that you're working with. Um, yes, I'll quickly say something to that. So I work in the in the fashion industry and I um, of course when I was growing up I was growing up with a certain conditioned idea of what fashion was. And what I didn't really understand is that I think coming as well to this talk um, yeah, your body always has a conversation with the layers that you wear and that happens on all levels um, actually the microbiome of your body has a conversation with you know the dyes that are used in the yarn the way that the yarn is spun and I had to decolonize and re-evaluate and re remember my own inherent connection to cloth and in that way also to art and to culture because I really believe that women are the early shapers of culture, where we are the ones within the communities that first started with pottery, with um, translating nature through spirit into something tangible. And I think through my work, and I've been working with communities from the mountains of Chachigistan to Afghanistan and from India um, and across Central Asia that are having these incredibly embodied and ancestral practices of working with the land and with nature. Um, and through that, I re-understood and relearned the value of facilitating a narrative through, through fashion, but also through art and through design, of making us collectively remember. Because this used to be inherently a part, and I come from a weaver's family myself, of all connections that we had to uh, the garments that we were wearing, because it used to be a reflection of our local nature, our local soils, our local microbiomes. So when I look at, for example, the, the history of my own family, we used to have like linen fields in Holland. We used to have certain seasonal dyes. And if you liked a piece of fashion, you knew that it was a, made by a certain woman that you know explained her tradition into that piece of cloth. And now when we think of fashion, we think of a made-up vision or a made-up idea. And I can say this because I had a very brief, unsuccessful modeling career where I sort of ended up being like, hey, wait a minute, the story that I'm representing is not actually the story that the cloth is speaking of. And this is a larger thing, and I think this links in with um, decolonization of our supply chain and like facilitating back these voices. Because when you look at the fashion industry and the farmer's industry, actually, 
80% of people that work in fashion, that take a part in fashion, are women, although we own less than 10% of global capital. And just in India alone, when you look at the land, you know how that's sort of given to the people. It's like 80% of people that work on the land, for example, in the cotton industry, are women, although they only own 11% of the land itself. So it's a women's rights issue, it's a decolonization issue, it is, but also an incredible way of collectively remembering our inherent connection to nature and to creativity um, as a platform. And I think that's sort of the, the beautiful thing that's now happening in these spaces where we're coming together with, with people from different fields and you know, from architecture to indigenous backgrounds and we're, we're re-evaluating like, okay, how can we connect people back because in the end like the sustainable revolution is a connective revolution and it is something how we can hold life and all its manifestations as sacred and I think that is something that we that happened within Europe because I feel before we started the process of colonization we first colonized our own lands and took people away from the land into the cities and made spirit, you know, spirit is so, and I think this is what Nina was, was speaking about, spirit is interwoven into every single thing within the forest. And that had a similar thing here in Europe, but at some point we started saying spirit is something vague up in the sky. So in therefore took away our responsibility and our relationship of all the living elements that carry this inherent sacredness around us. So I think we're at a really interesting point right now where we like intellectually, emotionally, creatively, and on all levels of um, yeah, what it means to be hum human, like reconnect to this element of creation. Now, it's fascinating because you started this brand uh, called Zazi uh, Vintage, and it's basically uh, a company, and it kind of combines or brings together all the things you've just described now. Uh, but it's also a lot to do with exchange, with collaborations, you work with villages, you work with different communities. Can you talk a little bit about this and how it connects also to the theme then of mutual aid? And one of the things I was particularly interested in is I was the other day uh, in conversation with um, Gabriela Hurst. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you met uh, Gabriela because Gabriela Hurst has actually uh, her own fashion line and, and uh, has done uh, a completely carbon neutral fashion show recently. So. <laughs> The main focus of you know practices was no absolutely no energy was used. It was all uh, solar energy. There was no travel needed, um, and uh, I was just curious in terms of that also if uh, uh, you could talk a little bit about uh, the idea of having a carbon neutral fashion brand. So it's two questions really in one. Okay, <laughs> um, I think um, for me first and foremost, and I think this is the most interesting process within design because design, just like everything, how we interact with life, is a co-creation. And I think that's what the industry, I mean, both in art and architecture and also in the fashion industry has forgotten. And this is such an interesting thing for me to not come to, let's say, you know, the incredible like creators in like a rural Chajik village and be like, I'm the fashion designer, let's make a dress like this. But to come together and be like, okay, first of all, how many women are here? What exactly are their skills? What do they need? Like on a long term, what is like what what grows seasonally? What what can we like help you facilitate to revive? And then more importantly, also on a design level, and I think this is my favorite thing in the whole world to sort of come together and be like, okay, what story do you want to tell through your weaving of the yarn? And what story do you want to tell to the world about your culture and community? And I think by um, I mean, that's like a process of decolonization, but actually this beautiful invitation for what it really truly means to co-create is to, because I don't see myself as a fashion designer or as uh, somebody that wants to make a certain name. I just really want to set up a platform where women can share their own stories through the weaving and the embroidery and the stories that they have. And through that, I've just discovered the most incredibly, there's such a connective wisdom. Like I remember I interviewed, uh, or I connected to Tami now, who set up a local um, enterprise called Ozara. Um, it means fire in Persian, which is because she works with a lot of um, women that have gone uh, sexual violence and re rediscover their inherent fire by working with needle and thread. 
and the way that they explain life and the whole universe within like a single piece of fabric and cloth is that they embroider a black thread onto a white fabric which represents life and death and the transcendence of life. And then on top of that, they embroider these flowers that represent all the moments of joy that they experience as being a woman in a woman's body in between life and death. And just having this piece of cloth and then hearing Tamina speak, and then I just like, my, my most, my like biggest wish in the world to, is to connect everybody to that inherent truth because when I was listening to these stories and this happens on a daily basis from, from Tajikistan to the most rural villages in India where they work with agroforestry and where they regenerate and you know fashion, fashion for biodiversity really um, to revive this ancestral craftsmanship and this connective layer within the fashion industry. Like we don't need to make up stories about design or concepts, we can just listen to people that have these connective, deep embodied practices. Um, carbon neutral design, I also have probably opinions about this. Let me think. I think for me the most important thing, um, like let's be honest, we don't need any, we don't need to produce any more clothing in the world. We have enough to dress up for, you know, the next generations and next generations to come. So it's recycling, upcycling. Also really important, but I think there's this sort of like awkward moment where we're trying to like unify an unsustainable system with or like new sustainability ideas. So we're coming up with all of these sort of marketing terms. I mean, you've all seen like the recycled plastic bottle bathing suits, you know, all of these different layers where I think it's wonderful and there are these amazing innovations of design. But in the end, when I ask anybody of you, like, what is your favorite piece in your wardrobe? It's like linked to this incredible story. Like you kissed your first love in it, or you, um, you know, got it from your grandmother, or it's a special woven story that you collected it somewhere in a back alley. And I think this is what truly uh, embodies sustainability: is this personal connection with the garment. So if we as brands or as designers can facilitate this this inherent connection back, so that when you buy something from Zazie, but could be any company, that you understand the deep connected story behind it, then I think that makes sustainable design sustainable design. So, does that answer the question? A great answer, yes. Okay. <laughs> now, we have not had the opportunity to have a quick coffee break, because we always thought that there might be a moment when, you know, but the flow is just so amazing. It's amazing. And everything connects to everything, and we've had such amazing presentation said there was never a moment, so maybe we just need to reinforce the moment. As Philippe Parino always says, la chaîne est belle, it's a beautiful chain reaction. We, of course, have already uh, yeah. Joseph's book ready to be discussed in terms of the non-extractive. I think it connects very deeply to what yeah. uh, uh, you've all been talking about, but maybe five or ten minutes? <laughs> uh, I can't wait also because uh, the, the second part will be with Cicel. Tolas with the smell molecules uh, that Salome can uh, say a lot about and the connection between Rafik's work uh, that is exhibited here and not Vital's work that is exhibited here and then uh, obviously leading already in tomorrow's day in the non-extractive and regenerative architecture. So coffee break five to ten minutes max. Thank you very much. <laughs>